Hey, why don't you open your Bibles up to, uh, to Genesis chapter 1. And I was just thinking, you know, it's been a while since I've had the uh, privilege of getting to share on a Sunday morning. So I do want to share just uh, a couple life updates uh, from Morgan and I. Uh, we just celebrated on New Year's Eve our two-year anniversary. So Fred and Judy, we're, we're trying to catch up here. Um, but yeah, we, we still love marriage. We still like it, still recommend it. No, but I'm more in love with Morgan every single day. And you know, around two years, the question starts to get thrown around, uh, you know, when are you going to have kids? And I can't count how many times I've been asked that question. Uh, so actually, we're excited to announce that we got a dog. So this is our Christmas card photo. That's Morgan, me, and that's little Sherwood. Someone say, aw. Has anyone ever raised a puppy before? Anyone ever raised a puppy? So I used to not be a dog person. I wasn't for 24 years until God uh, supernaturally changed my heart. So we're actually going to have some prayer ministry for that at the end. Uh, we're going to pray for God to change your heart too if you don't like dogs. Um, but raising a puppy has been way harder than I ever thought it would because he doesn't do what we tell him to do most of the time. And so we started to kind of chase him around the house. We realized if we take our eyes off him for one second, he will bite something he's not supposed to. Uh, or his favorite thing we learned is to uh, leave us little gifts inside the house that he should leave outside when we turn away for literally one second. So he actually got in the habit of when he did something he knew he wasn't supposed to be doing, he would run straight under the couch. So I just want to show you a picture of it because it's so cute. So we go, sure would, and he'd look at us, run away. And actually just two weeks ago, uh, he tried to run under the couch. He was like, kind of embarrassed by his mistake and he, uh, he, he can't fit under the couch anymore. So he hit it and kind of just stopped and laid down, very confused. <laughs> so you can take that picture off. I know it's kind of silly, but I just share that because we're actually gonna talk about hiding this morning. And I just think it's this funny illustration that really is actually quite true for our lives is how many times when we make a mistake, do we run from God instead of to him? I'm going to say that one more time because I think there's a question that the Holy Spirit's asking us this morning is when we make a mistake, are we running from God or to him? And we're going to talk about hiding and we're going to talk specifically, we're in a series called Moving, Removing the Mask. And we're going to talk this morning about the mask of the lies that we believe about ourselves that aren't true. And I would venture to say a lot of us in the room this morning are actually wearing masks, believing things about ourselves that aren't true, that are preventing people around us from seeing who we really are, and that we're using to hide ourselves from God. So we're going to look at that this morning from the story of the Bible, and we're going to go through kind of just some key points from the whole story of scripture. Because I think we as the people of God need to be shaped, not just by individual stories, but really this is the story that we're a part of from Genesis to Revelation. And so uh, we're going to look at different times throughout scripture where people hide because they're believing lies about themselves. So it all starts in Genesis chapter 1. And uh, Genesis chapter 1 is this beautiful account of God creating the heavens and creating the earth. And it's like this beautiful uh, symphony. And it's kind of like, for those of you who know music terminology, a crescendo that gets louder and louder and more beautiful. And there's trumpets and horns and harps and beautiful music. And then all of a sudden, there's this climactic moment. And it's almost as if the music stops and time stands still. And in Genesis 1, 26, it says, Then God said, let us make humankind in our image. Say image. image. According to our likeness. In verse 27, so God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So this is how God sets off humanity. And he says that we are made in his image. But here's what, so here's what that's referring to. It's not referring uh, to a reflection. So mirrors actually weren't invented until 1835. Didn't you know that? Mirrors weren't invented until 1835. A German chemist uh, realized that he could put metallic silver on glass and you could see a reflection. I mean, isn't that crazy? For, for thousands of years, people had no idea what they looked like unless they had like a painting of themselves. So here's what this verse is not talking about. It's not talking about like a mirror reflection. That's not what it means to be made in God's image. 
It's also not talking about a, um, like a reflection in like a pool of water or something like that, mainly because how many of you have ever successfully stared into a body of water and saw an accurate reflection of yourself? It's really hard to find a crystal clear pool that you can look at. So it's probably not talking about really any sort of reflection. Actually, what the word image implies it, is, it would have been like some of the other gods, the other uh, gods that were worshipped around Israel, uh, when they would... Um, want to represent themselves on earth, um, that the people would make uh, little statues or idols of the deity. So there'd be like an image of Baal, which was like a little statue, or an image of Asherah, which was like a little statue. And so when God says he makes humans in his image, he actually means he makes us as little statue type representations of him on earth. So what does that mean? That means that we as humanity are not just designed to reflect God, we're actually designed to represent God. That means that we're not just kind of mirror shallow images of God, actually the characteristics of God are actually knit into who we are as humans, and if we know who God is, we know who we are. And that's the core truth about what it means to be human is that if we know who God is, we know who we are because we're made in his image. So that means if God is a father, that means we are sons and daughters. If God is good, that actually means the original intention of humanity is to be good. If God is light, the original intention of humanity is to be light and to represent his actual characteristics on earth. So here's what I want to say this morning is anything you've heard other than those things about yourself is not true and it's called a lie. So let's look at where that comes in in the story. So the music changes. The music changes in Genesis 3 and it goes from a happy crescendoing symphony to kind of that foreboding, foreshadowing music in movies where it gets dark and it gets sinister and we meet a new character in Genesis 3 called the serpent. And in Genesis 3, it says this, it says, the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say... Did we catch the parallelism there from Genesis 1? Genesis 1 said, and God said, and now we have a serpent trying to turn that on its head saying, did God say? How many of you have ever heard that voice before? Did God really say that? Are you sure? It says, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, you shall die. So we can eat all these trees except the one in the middle. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. I have a question. Wasn't Eve already like God? Didn't Genesis 1 say that she was made in his image, in his likeness? Is it possible that the serpent is lying to Eve about who she is? It says, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil, as if she's not already like God, made in his image. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was a delight to the eyes that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate, and then the eyes of both were open. They knew that they were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves together as loincloths for themselves. Can I suggest this this morning? Um, how many of you have ever heard of this story being called The Fall? I just want to see. It's kind of a church world, so you, you might have had to grow up in church. I just want to see your hands. So here, here's what I want to point out, and this is just a, a theory, but the, the, the word The Fall is nowhere in the text. That, that word is not in the text of the Bible. It was added uh, by theologians actually generations later to describe what's going on. And to be honest, I want to honor them and, and, and agree with some parts of what they're saying. But the reality is, like, nobody, like, falls in this passage. Like, nobody trips. Like, there's no cliff that somebody falls off. Uh, here's what I want to suggest this morning is what if we called this story the lie? Because I think that's what's going on here is Adam and Eve were walking as sons and daughters of God in his image. And 
everything goes wrong as soon as the serpent lies to them about who they are. And I can't help but think this morning, some of us have heard some lies, things that the Bible doesn't say about us, things like, hey, you're rejected and abandoned. Things like, hey, you have to work in order to earn God's love. He doesn't love you unless you check all the boxes and show up to church. Things like, you're always going to be broken. Your mistakes define you. Things that aren't true. How many of you have heard some lies in your life? And here's what happens is Adam and Eve hear these lies about who they are, and they sew together fig leaves. Here's a picture of a fig leaf just to kind of illustrate it. They sew together these giant leaves that then become a mask that they use to hide from each other and to hide from God. What if this morning some of us have been believing lies about ourselves that we have used to sew together uh, to become masks that we use to hide from the people around us and from the Lord? They really were loved by God, yet they believed they had to hide from him. They really were children of God, yet they believed the lie and shame came in. And the next time, as we got, kind of move through the story, the next time we see someone hiding uh, because of a lie is actually in the story of Judges. And in Judges, uh, there's Gideon. And Gideon's a warrior, and, and the angel of the Lord comes to visit Gideon while he's beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. So here's what I want to suggest this morning is Gideon is a warrior who's supposed to be in battle, but instead he's hiding, beating out wheat in the wine press, meaning he's doing the wrong thing in the wrong place, probably hoping that nobody's going to find him and call him out. Can I suggest this morning that just like Adam and Eve, Gideon is hiding in some shame. And he's hiding in his shame. And shame is what causes us to hide. And God, in the angel of the Lord walks in and kind of speaks on behalf of God, speaks on behalf of God's voice. Uh, the angel of the Lord walks in, and here's what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, Gideon, you screw up. What are you doing hiding? He walks in and tells Gideon who he is, reminds Gideon who he is, oh mighty man of valor. And it's an identity statement that gets Gideon out of the pit of shame. What if some of us this morning are hiding in our sin and in our shame and God's not walking in to say, look at what you've done. He's walking in to say, remember who you are. I can't help but think there's some sons and daughters in the room this morning that are hiding in their anxiety and God wants to walk in and say, remember who you are, my child. I can't help but think there's some people in the room this morning that are hiding in their depression and the shame of it and God's walking right into the middle of our depression to say, remember who you are, my child. The masks are going to come off this morning. I believe it. And later on in the story of the Bible, we get to, the, we get to the, the prophet Zechariah. And Zechariah has a vision. And what he sees in this vision is quite unique. He says, uh, then he, talking about God, showed me in this vision the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan at his right hand to accuse him. And this word Satan, um, say Satan. Satan. Satan is actually a Hebrew word that we've kind of transformed into a proper name. We use it like it's a proper name, like it's a person, like Satan had two demon parents that gave birth to him, and they're like, your name's Satan. That's not what happened. It's actually a Hebrew word uh, that means accuser or adversary. And so when you read this verse in Hebrew, it's actually the same word twice. It says, and the accuser standing at his right hand to accuse him. That's who Satan is. He's an accuser, or we could say a liar. And what's he doing in the story? He's standing at the right hand of Joshua, accusing him, telling him lies about who he is. It's the same serpent that was in the garden that we see. 
And then a little bit later, Jesus comes and Jesus teaches on the accuser, which we're going to refer to Satan from now on in this message as the accuser, because that, that's what it literally translates to. Uh, so Jesus has a message on the accuser. Does anyone want to hear this morning the longest message Jesus preaches on Satan in the Bible? Um, I bet you've never heard a sermon like that on a Sunday morning, the longest message Jesus preaches on Satan. But here it is, John chapter 8. I was exposing the lies this morning. He says, he's talking to the Pharisees, and he says, you Pharisees are from your father, the devil, and you chose to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he's talking about Satan right now, from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus then comes and affirms story, uh, the story in the garden, affirms Zechariah and says, this is who the accuser is. He's the father of lies. It's what he does. And I can't help but think this morning that uh, some people might be in the bondage of the father of lies who's been lying to them about who they are. But Jesus wants to invite you to meet the father of light this morning. The father of lies tries to keep you in your sin and your shame. But the father of light says, come into my freedom. The father of lies tries to tell you you're defined by your struggle, you're defined by your addiction, you're defined by your failure, but the father of light says you're defined by my love. And there's freedom this morning. Here's what I want to tell you this morning. I feel like there's some people in here that have been wearing these masks for so long, they've forgotten who they are. But I want to tell you this morning, Jesus didn't die on the cross and rise again for you to have half freedom. He died on the cross and rose again for you to have 100% freedom. And this is the end of the story in Revelation. This is where it's all going. This is the direction of our lives. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, it says this. It says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah, our Savior. For the accuser of our comrades has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. This is the end of Satan's story is he's thrown down once and forever. But this is what Jesus tells us to pray. He tells us to pray that his kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. How many of you want to see the accuser be thrown down in your life today? And that's the hope of the gospel. This is where the story is going and we don't have to live under the bondage of those lies anymore. We're going to take the masks off this morning. We're going to take the masks off this morning. I even feel some of us have been looking in the mirror, believing things about ourselves that aren't true. And this morning, you're going to walk home, or this afternoon, you're going to walk home, and you're not going to recognize who's in the mirror because Jesus took the mask off. What is mask? Mask comes from the middle French word meaning to cover or hide to protect the face. And uh, I just want to show you, we just have like a few different pictures of masks. This is an African mask. Um, the next one is an Egyptian mask. The next one is a, a Korean mask. The next one is a Venetian mask from Venice. The next one is a, a Chinese mask. And this is just to show you, uh, it's really fascinating. If you look at the history of masks, they're, they're very old in our archaeological record. A long time ago, people started using masks. And really, in every culture all across the globe, people have worn masks. Isn't that interesting? It's almost as if there's something in the heart of humanity, maybe from Genesis 3, that wants to hide, that wants to self-protect, that wants to, to get away and not, not be raw and be vulnerable. And really, I have my own kind of experience with masks. I grew up as a, as, a, as a theater nerd in high school. And one of the things we had to do is we had to do a mask-making class. And so what you do when you make masks is you, it's kind of gross. I wanted to do it up here. I really did. But it was so, uh, it just would be terrible because you have to cover your face with Vaseline. And then what you do is you take individual plaster strips and then you kind of get them wet and then lay them on the Vaseline and you lay it over and over and over until it becomes hard. So I actually found, it's not like a professional video or anything, but I just really want to illustrate this um, and what it looks like to actually build a mask. Because uh, I think some of us have been building masks our, our whole lives. So let's take a look at, at what this looks like. So he's covered, he's got Vaseline on his face right there. And they literally lay it strip by strip. It's also kind of suffocating. That's why I didn't want to do it up here. It's, 
they're covering everything. I think they're even going to put something on his nose, too. Anyone want to do this after service today? <laughs> there you go, and it's done. And then it dries, and then they take it off. So here's, so, so here's what I want to show you. You take that off, but because here's, I think it's just such a perfect illustration of what happens when we believe lies. The enemy says, you're rejected, and we put it on. The enemy says, you're abandoned, and we put it on. The enemy says, you're broken beyond repair, and we put it on. The enemy says, you're only as valuable as you look, and we put it on. The enemy says, you're a bad parent because of the way your kids are behaving and we put it on. The enemy says, you're defined by your addiction. It's who you are, and we put it on. And before long, we've covered our entire face, and just like Adam and Eve covered themselves with fig leaf after fig leaf, we've covered ourselves with lie after lie, and I think some of us don't even know who we really are anymore because we're so buried in the lies. We've forgotten the voice of our father that says, you're my son, you're my daughter, I love you, I, I, I'm not mad at you, I, I want to accept you, and we're listening to the voice of lies in our lives. So I just want to see, I, I, I have a few more in here, I'm, you're not doing enough, you're a mistake, you can't hear God's voice, you're always going to struggle with this, you're defined by your pain. I just want to see, if we could be honest this morning, how many of you have ever heard one of those lies before? Just lift your hand. Just be honest. Just be honest. Okay, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Just to be honest here, let's look around. Okay, this is common. This is the human experience. So keep your hands up. If you've heard one of those lies this month. Okay, keep one of those hands up. You've heard one of those lies like this week. Okay, keep your hands up if you've heard one of those lies like this morning driving to church, okay? This is a common experience, and it's a battle that we're fighting over and over. And I just have a question for you. What do you call it when you fight a lot of battles over and over and over? What do you call that? A war. Um, how many of you would fight a war by yourselves? Like, like, just imagine, it's kind of a silly illustration, but just imagine, like, George Washington sitting at the breakfast table with Martha, his wife, being like, you guys know who George Washington is? It's on the $1 bill. Fought the revolution over. Just imagine George Washington sitting at the breakfast table with Martha. I mean, like, Martha, I'm going to fight the king of England today. I'm done with this whole colony thing. We've got to be our own country. And Martha's like, man, well... Who are you going to take with you, George? That's a great idea. George is like, nobody. I'm going to sail across the Atlantic Ocean and fight him by myself. That's ridiculous. Nobody does that. But how many of us are trying to fight the war of our lives by ourselves? In 1967, uh, Catherine Switzer uh, was a woman, and she signed up for the Boston Marathon in a time uh, when women were not allowed in the Boston Marathon. It was a males-only race. And so she signs up for the Boston Marathon under the name K.J. Switzer, uh, which are her initials, so that nobody would question her. She shows up to race day. It's cold, uh, so she's wearing a beanie. Uh, she gets her number. She puts it on. Nobody says anything. She starts to run in the Boston Marathon. It's all men except for her. And um, as she's running, she uh, gets warm, because I guess it gets warm when you run marathons. I don't know. And so she takes the beanie off, and uh, she has her, her, her qualification number on, and the press truck drives by her while she has her hair down. And the organizer of the race is on the press truck. And these are the literal words of the organizer on the press truck when he sees a woman running. He says, you're not qualified. Get out of the race. Actually, he says, get out of my race. I'll be specific there. He says, you're not qualified. Get out of my race. And then he literally, in front of the press trucks, jumps off the press truck, runs to her, tries to rip her number off, shouting, you're not qualified. Get out of my race. And then her friend, who's running with her, sees this guy trying to rip her number off, goes up behind her, sees the guy, and actually like side slams the guy, and he goes flying off on the side of the road. She becomes the first woman in history to finish the Boston Marathon. 
So I actually have a video of it because I want to I prove it in case you didn't believe me, but I do want to explain what happens first. So just see, just see this, uh, this awesome thing. Let's play the video. Okay, do it one more time. It happened really fast. Do it one more time. Bam. You know the book of Hebrews says this. One second. <clears throat> the book of Hebrews, just stay in the moment. Stay in the moment. I had to change my notes from the first service. Man, can anyone feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in the room right now? Yes. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight every sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus. I think some of us are trying to run a race, and the band can come up. Some of us are trying to run a race, and the enemy is trying to run behind us. We've been qualified by God. God said, you're my son. You're my daughter. I love you. And the enemy is trying to run from behind and rip that qualification off, say, no, you're not. You're not loved. You're not valuable. God doesn't like you. But here's what we want to do this morning is we want to let the Holy Spirit body slam the enemy out of the way so we can run our race looking at Jesus, okay? And just like none of us would try and fight a war by ourselves, we've got to bring some lies into the light this morning so we can pray as a community to break the power of those things in our lives. Here's, I'm so convicted of this. We probably hear, I mean, I don't know, tens, hundreds, thousands. We've heard so many lies in our life. That's why I like to get loud on a Sunday morning. It's not for the hype of it. It's literally because I want to be louder than the voice of the enemy because I'm done with him lying to God's people. So just a couple weeks ago, or not a couple weeks ago, sorry, a couple months ago, I preached um, on a Sunday service. I think it was in October. And really, right before that Sunday service, I was just being, to be completely transparent, I was battling uh, a lot with anxiety. Has anyone ever battled with anxiety before? I was battling a lot with anxiety. And, uh, and I, I didn't really realize what it was at first, because I've since learned that different people exhibit anxiety symptoms in different ways. Um, but the day before uh, I was about to preach, I, I actually walked around my neighborhood just in this utter pit of hopelessness and despair and anxiety and nervousness. Has anyone ever been in that pit before? You know what I'm talking about. You're just, the lies are so loud. And I kind of get through it. I preach on Sunday. I'm still not quite out of it. And then I'm in a call, a, a call with one of my leaders on a Monday. And, and uh, this leader asks me, he says, hey, have you ever asked God what your name is? And I'm like, my name's Ryan, like, no, like, I know my name, I'm, I'm smart, I know my name, and, he, and this leader's name, his name is Sam, uh, his name's Samuel, but he goes by Sam, and he just tells me, you know, whenever the Lord says my name, he, he says Samuel, and it reminds me of my calling, like Samuel in the Bible, to be a prophet, uh, and hear his voice, and speak them out, speak, the, speak his words out, and I was like, man, that's, that's significant. I, I want to hear what God calls me, what, what's, what's the voice of my father for me, and so I, I get alone in my room, I close the door, and I just ask God, I say, God, what, what's the name that you're giving to me? And I, and I just see this picture in my mind's eye of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 3 is standing, he's getting baptized by John. And this voice, the voice of the Father thunders out of heaven. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And you know what? I've preached that so many times, and I see this picture in my head. And what I preach about it is that it's before Jesus did anything. He didn't start his ministry. He'd done nothing yet. And before he does anything, the Father says, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. And then I remember uh, what I've read in different commentaries about Matthew 3, and they actually say, scholars say that that moment when Jesus is baptized is actually like his coronation where the Father puts a crown on him. And I remember that my name, Ryan, actually means little king. And the voice of the Father over my life was, you're my son, and I love you. I wonder this morning, are we listening to the voice of anxiety? 
Or are we listening to the voice of our Father? Are we listening to the voice of the lies this morning? Or are we listening to the voice of our Father? I think the Holy Spirit's doing something significant in this room. Let's stand together. We're just going to have a, a time here to respond. So I want to ask you just, just really five more minutes. Give the Holy Spirit space to do what he wants to do. But just close your eyes all across the room. If you're saying, uh, you know what? There's a lie that I've been believing about myself that's not true. Can you just lift your hand if that's you? Just say, there's a lie I've been believing about myself that's not true. You can put your hands down. I, and I really want to encourage all of us in the room, just start to ask the Father. Father, is there something I'm believing about myself that's not true this morning? And then I actually want to create a space. We don't really do this every week, but I really want to create a space up here. If you're saying, you know what, I'm done being, and being in bondage to those lies. I need freedom in my life. I want to encourage you. We're going to create a space up front. Just come and kneel before the Father. Say, God, I need your freedom this morning. You start to ask God, God, what's that lie that I've been believing about myself? And I tell you, there's freedom this morning. There's freedom this morning. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, depression can't stand. Anxiety can't stand. Yeah, just start to let him do a healing work in your heart. The masks are coming off right now. The masks are coming off. We break the power. Right now, in Jesus' name of shame, I'm just going to call out just a couple specific things, and then we're going to sing with Morgan. I, I break right now, in Jesus' name, the power of shame. Just with eyes closed all across the room, if you've been hiding in shame and you need freedom, and I want to say this, shame is the voice that says you are messed up. Okay, so conviction says I messed up. But shame says, I am messed up. And it turns our actions into an identity statement. So if that's you this morning, if you've been hiding in shame, if you've made your mistakes and your failure an identity statement, just with eyes closed, just lift your hand. If that's you, say, I need to, I need to come out of hiding from shame tonight, this morning. Yeah, just lift your hand. God, we break the power of shame in this room. God, I come against that spirit that says we are messed up. We are screwed up. That somehow our failure defines our identity. God, we give you permission to let the Father define our identity this morning. You know, I really feel called to go after this just with eyes closed. If that shame specifically is related to an area of sexual struggle. God actually wants to set you free from that bondage and the shame related to it. I feel like there's some people in the room, uh, you've actually been taken, and I know this is very sensitive, but I feel like God's doing it in the room. You've been taken advantage of in that way, and it's in, a, in, a, in the area of sexuality, and you've been struggling with the shame of that moment or the shame of what you've done. And so anything related to that at all, every eye closed across the room, this is very sensitive. If, if sexuality is at all related to the shame, I, I, I believe God's, dark, or God's light is going to pierce the darkness this morning. So just with eyes closed, if you need freedom in that area, just lift your hand. If that's you, yeah, there's hands all over the room. God, we break the power of this of the shame of sexual struggle. God, we break the power of the shame of pornography addiction. God, we break the power of the shame of things that have been done to us. God, we break it right now in Jesus' name, and we bring those lies into the light right now. We bring those lies into the light right now. the very last thing and then we're going to sing if these masks that we've been wearing these lies we've been believing have been causing pain in our lives i just feel like there's a lot of unhealed pain that's in the room and you know what i mean it's like it just hurts to think about those memories to think about those lies and you need god to come and heal some pain today just with eyes closed can you just lift your hand if that's you i got some pain that i need some healing god we break the power of that pain Right now, God, we invite you to come into every memory, come into every time where things were stolen from us, things went wrong. God, bring healing to the pain this morning.